Good Friday morning, everyone. I'm I'm so glad you're here. My name is Tim. I'm uh, hosting today's Backyard Naturalist from my kitchen office in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I can still see the street with all the waning colors of fall. It's it's absolutely gorgeous here. Uh, we're just a few days from All Hallows Evening, sometimes known as Halloween, uh, a time dedicated to remembering those who might have departed the living and freaking out and scaring the ones that are living. Um, still today. So we're, we're today we're talking about bats. Um, and you might be saying, hey, we've already done like three backyard naturalist episodes on bats. So why are you doing another one? And you'd be wrong because we've only done two so far. Um, and you should check them out. Back at the end of season two, Dan Goldman hosted just two fantastic episodes on bats. And that's where you want to go for like the real good stuff. Um, he, he did bats of the world uh, and, and white nose syndrome. Um, but bats are the second largest order of mammals in the world, and so I think they are deserving of another episode, and I'll focus on some new stuff, and um, especially because it's almost Halloween, and, and somehow, for some reason, this group of animals has become associated with Halloween. Um, and so at the end, I'll get a little bit into the origins of that um, in episode nine of season four of the Backyard Naturalist interview with the vampire bat, uh, an extra special Thank you to members of the Urban Ecology Center and subscribers to this series, uh, The Backyard Naturalist. Your support is so incredibly appreciated by myself, by this amazing research team, and by the Urban Ecology Center. We appreciate you immensely. A uh, quick reminder that next the next monthly subscriber trip is to Cudahy Woods on the south side of Milwaukee, uh, an incredible hidden gem. Trip is open to everyone, but it's free to subscribers, so... If you'd like to become a subscriber, let me know or visit the UEC webpage. And hotels are booked, vans are rented, and we're about to post information on a regional eco travel trip to the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore. I know some of you keep uh, asking about this trip, and we will have information very soon. But it's uh, we're, we're going to an incredible landscape that's not too far uh, from Milwaukee, not too far from well, fairly close to Chicago. Um, and we're also taking a side trip to Jasper Pulaski Fish and Wildlife Area, where we could see more than 10,000 sandhill cranes in a single field. So if you're interested in joining us for this trip, please contact me um, or look for a link coming soon, if you've already been contacting me, um, to the weekly Backyard Naturalist emails. And if you don't get those uh, and want to, let me know and I'll add you to that list. And if those trips aren't enough... My favorite birding event of the year is coming up, uh, the Christmas bird count on Saturday, December 17th. Uh, there are many ways to get involved in the CBC, and one of them is with the Urban Ecology Center. We'll start the day in Mitchell Park and take a long, lovely urban stroll along the Menominee River, past Amfam Field, uh, up through Doyne Park, past Hawthorne Glen, stopping for lunch at the Highland Cafe and then working our way over to Washington Park to end the day, after which we will shuttle you back to Mitchell Park. And there will be other uh, Christmas bird counts uh, in Milwaukee too, if you prefer to do one of the others. You can join us for the entire day or just a section of your choosing. We will be gathering valuable data for this worldwide community science event. And per the previous trips, just contact me if you'd like more information. No new updates on the Artemis mission that we've been following. Uh, it still has a November 14th launch date. And the, the, one of the cool things is even though there's some massive delays with Artemis 1, Artemis 2 is still on track, uh, if you believe them, for about 18 months from now in 2024. And Artemis 2 is going to send humans up. And they're not going to land on the moon yet. That's uh, Artemis 3. But we'll, we'll continue to monitor the situation. But for now, let's talk about bats. Um, so again, this is a very general bat story inter interspersed with little data, with a um, little trivia. And so it's not really like a general natural history. It's not like the background or biology. So again, if you want an excellent version of that, you can go back to Dan Goldman's two episodes that are uh, shown here. And today is going to be kind of more of a, a hodgepodge of, of stories kind of mixed with a couple of extremely cute videos. I'm going to give you the warning. Um, this is more of a, a storytelling session. Um, and speaking of storytelling session, uh, I do want to let everyone know that we're going to have one of our open mic 
sessions coming up again on December 30th to ring in the new year. And we'll have more information that, but this is a, a chance for us all to bring and tell our own stories, poems, uh, share your favorite books, resources, podcasts, videos, music. Um, we'll, we'll sit around a virtual fire together to ring in the new year. So look for that. Um, but again, today's episode is more of a, a hodgepodge of facts, a, a bat puri for Halloween. So with that in mind, bats are mammals in the order Chiroptera, which means hand wing. Chiro comes from the Greek word of hand, shows up in words like chiropractic or chiromancy. Anybody know what that is? That's the art of palm reading. Um, and then the word patera, terra, we've seen a lot uh, over the episodes. Pterodactyls means finger wings. Lepidoptera means scaly wing. So this is the order that uh, is called hand wing for maybe obvious reasons. Uh, I love this picture, not only because it kind of, well, it, it, it's a great picture showing the wing structure. You can see exactly how the wing is put together, but uh, you can also kind of see that massive upper body strength in bats. They're all like these little mini Arnold Schwarzeneggers because because flying takes a, a lot of energy and they need these well-developed muscles. Uh, bats are the only flying mammals, um, and the structure of their wing is essentially a hand with connective tissue, mainly in between the fingers, also between the arms and the feet and the body and all that. But that connective tissue that allows bats to fly is called the patagium. Uh, it's that kind of that flesh, that, that stretchy, bendy flesh. Um, the structure is very different from a bird wing. So in, in the bat, the bulk of the wing is made up of the fingers of the hand, but in a bird wing, the bulk is in, in the whole arm. So uh, if you wanna pretend you're a bird, uh, flap your whole arms, all of, you, you know, the, all of your arms. If you wanna pretend that you're a bat, uh, just flap your hands uh, and, and then uh, that's, that's a better bat imitation. Both of these animals fly very well in different ways um, with different mechanisms. Uh, the best flyers by far are the insects and mainly they've been, it, it's because they've been flying for way, way, way longer than birds. Uh, insects have been flying for 400 million years, so they've really got it down. Uh, birds have only been flying about 160 million years, which is still a long time. And then bats are the relative newcomers to the skies um, with about 50 million years of flight experience but they all fly very well in their own niches. And um, these are the only current groups of animals that have achieved true flight. And one kind of quirk uh, or limitation in bats is has to do with how they take off. So to, to achieve flight, you need either speed or wind or uh, a really good flapping. So insects, which are again, the true masters of flight, for the ones that do fly, Beetles maybe isn't the best example. They're a little awkward, but but most insects, they can just take off from wherever they are immediately. They're, you see them, then they're gone. So achieving fl uh, achieving flight, achieving lift for insects is, is relatively easy. Um, birds, for the most part, are pretty good at taking off. Uh, you, you'll see a, a warbler on a branch and it'll just fly right up. Um, if, if you want to think of one of the true art forms of flight, the mallard that takes off straight from the water, that's a pretty amazing uh, feat. The fact that they're in the water and then they have to, and they're big animals, and then they have to get up in the air and they can pretty much almost take off straight up. Uh, is pretty incredible when you think about the, the physics of flight and the dynamics of that. So that's a, you know, ma mallards are pretty common, but they achieve something uh, pretty extraordinary. Uh, for some birds, they need help. Uh, loon is more of a swimmer, and so to get airborne, it has to kind of run across the lake. And then the wonderfully awkward uh, and truly amazing albatrosses, which are fine once they're in the air, usually need help getting up in the air uh, with a, a stiff wind um, or height. And then, and then it's always really fun to watch them try to land too. Um, but bats also need help getting up and into the air. Uh, so that kind of leads us to one of the most recognizable adaptation in bats and that what they're not flying, they're hanging and, and they're hanging upside down. So what this allows them to do is to use gravity 
to help them achieve lift, to achieve flight. Uh, so they can drop. The dropping gives them that critical initial speed that then they can then use their, their wings um, to, to continue to provide thrust. So they can't take off from the ground, but they can easily take flight if they drop from a height. So then the question is, well, what if a bat is on the ground or if it's not high enough to, to, to make that drop into flight? And then you kind of, a parachute has come to mind. So if you're a parachutist, if you have a parachute and you're jumping off uh, a bridge, that's not gonna help you. I mean, I guess it depends on the type of parachute and the height of the bridge, but a parachute needs to get to a certain height in order for the parachute to open and then allow you to, to fall. And it's kind of similar to bats. They need a, they, they can't be too low to the ground, otherwise they'll just kind of probably flop onto the ground. Um, so they kind of need that minimum distance to drop so that the wings kick in. And then if you're on the ground, what do you do? Well, if we look back at the, the wing pattern of the bat, you see that most of the fingers are used in the wing, but you have that cool little thumb sticking up. Um, and it's the only finger that's not in, encased in the patigium, but it you know kind of sticks out like a, like a sore thumb. And it's, um, it's, it, they use this thumb as a claw for climbing. So if you're on the ground at a low spot, use that thumb, that claw to climb, help you climb up, up a cave, up a, a barn, wherever it is where you have to get high for roosting. You need to be there for safety anyway or again, to achieve uh, a place to drop into flight. But if you're already up there and you need a quick quick escape route, um, you can just drop from a height. And interestingly, there's one bird species, um, a very primitive and, and maybe one of my favorite bird species called the Hawatsin, that the young Hawatsins also retain that one finger. They use a similar adaptation to bats. Uh, that finger functions as a claw for climbing, which is really important for a young Hawatsin because their nests are above rivers in the Amazon where there's hungry caiman. And, and so if they happen to fall out of the nest, um, they can use that little claw to climb back up to safety. So bats have this unique and strange adaptation, strange to us, uh, not strange to a bat, of hanging upside down. And then that leads to, to a lot of these other fun questions. Um, for me, the first one is how the heck can they hang on for so long without getting tired and even sleep while holding onto the ceiling? Why do they not just fall down? Um, previously, I posed this question in relation to birds and you know, how can a bird sleep on a perch without falling off? And um, the, the quick answer to that is also best related in terms of humans. So if a human is hanging on a bar, um, it sounds like the beginning of a bad joke, uh, humans hang on a bar, but to remain hanging, they have to continually exert energy. So if I'm hanging on a bar, I have to put energy into my hands to hang there. Um, so clenching my fist requires energy. Eventually, I will get too tired, and when that happens, um, I will fall down. So there's no way that we could fall asleep hanging from a bar like a bird or a bat, because when our fists relax, our hands unclench. Birds are the opposite, and I've mentioned this before. A bird has to exert energy to unclench its toes. So when they first land on a branch, they grab it. But then when, when gravity takes over and their body kind of perches on their feet, they, their tendons and bone structure uh, cause the feet to clench when the body comes down on it. And so the relaxed state for the bird is a clenched foot, and that allows them to sleep. And uh, it's the pretty much the same thing for a bat. Bats have an interesting physiology, the, the relationship of their tendons and where they're attached. So at first they do have to clench the branch or the ceiling or whatever it is they are. Um, but as soon as gravity, as soon as they allow their body to relax and gravity pulls down on the body of the bat, that causes those feet to clench as well. So in their relaxed state for the bat or the bird, those feet are clenched and they can fall asleep in that position. In fact, even if a bat were to be unfortunate enough to die in, in its sleep, it would remain hanging uh, there for quite a while after death because the feet would stay clenched. Um, so this is how bats can sleep hanging upside down. And again, we already know that there's an advantage of being up there uh, if it needs to achieve flight quickly and efficiently. There are over 1,400 species of bats 
they're this represent the second largest order of mammals after rodents. Uh, bats make up 20% of all mammal species. So one out of every five mammals is a bat. And if you ever go to tropical areas, this percentage will increase. And, and there's many areas of the world where bats are the number one uh, species of mammals outnumbering the rodents, um, depending on location. Uh, again, Dan does a really good job at looking at a lot of the different cool types and species of bats. Uh, so I won't do that now, uh, I, but I, I am going to give you fair warning. Uh, if you if you can't handle extreme cuteness, uh, you may want to look away from your screen for the next couple of slides. So uh, remember how the world's smallest bird is called the bee hummingbird. Well, the smallest bat is, you could probably guess, called the bumblebee bat. Um, also known by kitty's hog-nosed bat, but bumblebee bat is way better. Uh, they're in Thailand and Myanmar. Not only is this the world's smallest bat, it's likely the world's smallest mammal. Uh, they measure in barely more than an inch long, like 1.1 inches uh, from head to tip of tail, which is, for perspective, the length of a standard paper clip, a little flying paper clip, and they weigh in at just two grams, which is about the same weight as a dime. So uh, this I'm going to let this next slide kind of sink in for a minute. So I know this doesn't translate directly because we are all watching this on different size screens. So we, we are all looking at a slightly different size bat right now. But on my laptop right now, this is a scale this to be the actual size of the bumblebee bat. So you can just imagine this little thing flying around, um, probably singing a, a song um as it as it goes around um eating insects so tiny so cute um so yeah okay if the world's smallest bat is this cute then then there's no way the world's largest bat could also be this cute but yes we're all wrong there i was wrong there so this is the world's largest bat the the golden crowned flying fox of the philippines um this picture documents its cuteness it weighs over three pounds which is about what my laptop weighs and its wingspan is longer than the height of many of us listening, uh, about five foot six inches. So huge range in sizes between the largest and smallest bats. Um, and for a long time, bats were classified primarily on size. So the large bats they put into the suborder Mega Chiroptera and the smaller bats are, are in the order Micro Chiroptera. Those categories still kind of exist today, but it's it's, it's more complex than that. They're, they've added genetic evidence, evidence um, to give us a much better picture of how bats are related to each other and how they're classified. Um, so it's still okay to kind of think in the mega and micro, but it's 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 based on way more than just size. Um, the the largest micro bats are quite a bit bigger than the smallest uh, mega bats, uh, and but in in general, you, you still have these two major categories. So. The microbats are realistically the ones that give people the creeps when they think of bats. Um, we we don't tend to like it if a pattern of a mammal doesn't fit the pattern that a lot of other mammals have, and that's what makes things look odd or strange or scary to us. Um, and these are likely the bats that have evoked images of literary ghouls and fiends and, and gargoyles that grace our buildings and, and you know, movie characters. Uh, as a general rule, the, these microcharaptera are carnivorous and the primary food item for them is not us, it's insects. There are a, a, a couple that eat blood, there's, there's a couple that eat other things, but for the most part, these, um, these animals that we tend to shun and vilify because they look like demons are the ones that we should give a ton of love and respect because uh, when I say they eat insects, they eat a lot of insects. The little brown bat, this is the most common bat in North America, or at least I don't know if it hope, hopefully still is after white nose. Uh, but in, in an evening, one evening, a little brown bat can eat 1200 mosquitoes. And I think about that when I'm on a, a night hike at Washington Park and, and we'll see these little brown bats going around and just so happy that that they're eating the insects uh, because I, I love almost all animals. Mosquitoes are, are one that I'm still having a hard time uh, wrapping that my, my brain around loving them, respecting them, 
Um, so I'm, I'm kind of happy that these little brown bats are doing the work of reducing the mosquito population. The 20 million Mexican free tail bats that live in Bracken Cave in Texas in, a, in one night eat about 200 tons of insects, not just mosquitoes, a lot of different kinds of insects. And a lot of those insects are potential agricultural pests. So they're friends to the farmers and they're friends to all of us that benefit from consuming what those farmers produce. Microbats are primarily the bats that use echolocation, um, which is the use of ultrasonic sound to find prey like a sonar. While they're flying, they emit the sound in little beeps, and then they listen for the reflection of that sound to, to really create an auditory field of vision. So you think of, uh, it's not vision, it's, it's, it's auditory, but you think of when we look at the world, we can look in all directions and we can get an image. Um, and then bats do that also, but their image is, is created by sound. And then their brain kind of turns that into an image you know, we don't know exactly what that's like, but it's it's probably uh, something similar to what we can see. Um, and and uh, but again, it requires a brain that can do that. Um, there are humans. There's there are a couple instances where humans can um, have have been known to echolocate through through just sound. Um, it's very rudimentary, um, and and there are other animals that do that. But bats uh, have 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 it down really really well. So if a bat is in pursuit of a moth. It will emit sonar. Um, if it if it's closing in on a moth, it's going to emit that sonar at a much more rapid rate because it needs a more detailed view of its surroundings. It's trying to capture that moth. Um, in this picture here, this the you see the mouth of the bat is open, and it's not because it needs to grab that bat with its mouth. Its mouth is open because it's emitting the sonar through its mouth. So you know, sonar uses things that we're familiar with. It uses the mouth to produce an image and or produce the, the sound. And then the ears listen for the reflection of that sound. Um, and it's just so fine tuned that it can let the bat know not only where the object is in space, but the size of the object, the distance to that object. Uh, and with the help of the Doppler effect, the direction that the object is moving. And of course, it has to compensate for the fact that it's also moving. Um, so extremely detailed, um, extremely complex, uh, but effective way of, of seeing the world. And it's really this echolocation that produces these strange to us uh, body features. So the ears, you know, a lot of bats have these very complex ears with a lot of folds, and that helps them to really better uh, pick apart the incoming signals. So and, and one of the things that it really helps it too is, is that 360 or all around view, not just a planar view. So we as humans evolved, you know, on as ground dwelling organisms and, and the things that we needed to know most were on our plane. You know, if we're hunting for something or if something is hunting us, we need to know the direction that it's coming from um, so that we can react. And, you know, sound travels in waves. And if it hits one of our ears before the other one, that allows us to get a, a pretty good direction of where that sound is coming from, especially then we can move our head and so that our ears get in a position. And once our ears get in a position where the sounds are hitting both of them at the same time, then we know that we're looking in the direction of the sound. That all works really well until you introduce sounds coming from above and below you, because that sort of complicates things. Uh, particularly if a, if a sound is, is directly above you or directly below you, or directly in front of you or behind you, all of those sounds can produce, will produce uh, waves that hit your ears at the same time. So that kind of confusing you, you could be looking at it or it could be behind you or above you. Um, and, and so several animals have adapted to, to, to moving from a two dimensional sound plane to a three dimensional sound plane. Owls have one ear above the other with the openings uh, that, that incredibly cute head tilt you'll see from a dog is is kind of its way of figuring out the the sound a little bit better on that you know up and down plane, but for bats they just have these incredibly complex ears so that when um, the sound hits those ears and bounces around it, it's able to kind of figure out uh, is it above me below me in which direction so 
super cool, but it, it also explains those, those odd looking ears that we see. But then you also get these odd looking noses, which isn't explained, at least by the listening part. Uh, what explains that is that a lot of bats echolocate by again, opening their mouth and producing the sound. But some echolocating bats are fruit eaters. They still need to echolocate. They still need to be able to see in the darkness. Um, but if you've got a fruit in your mouth, uh, it's hard to ha ha. You, it's, it's, you, that, that ultrasound isn't going to work because the fruit is in the way. So what they've done is, is they've adapted these noses that can kind of get above the fruit. Um, and then, you know, we can talk through our noses. Uh, they can echolocate through their noses uh, and, then, and then hear through their ears. Um, and so that's that allows bats to still echolocate while they have something in their mouth. So that's that's why they just have these crazy complex ears and often crazy complex noses, um, mostly because of, of echolocation. The megabats are are not really in the order megachiraptor anymore. It's pteropodid day or suborder order. Um, on average, they do tend to still be larger. And for humans, they have a facial pattern that is much more recognizable to us, that is much more common among mammals. And it's one of the reasons then that we think they, they are cuter. Um, we give them names for the animals they resemble. So you have flying foxes, flying mice. Uh, if you don't like them, maybe flying rats. But the reality is these bats are much more closely related to us than they are to foxes or mice or rats, rodents, those kind of things. Um, and one of the reasons that they, they have this more typical mammal face is because they don't echolocate. It was the echolocation that really drove those, those crazy uh, face patterns. Um, so, but they, they, they navigate through their world using their regular eyes and ears. And uh, by the way, the phrase blind as a bat makes no sense. Almost every bat has, even the echolocating ones have very sharp vision. Um, they have rods and cones. They have good color vision in the day. They have they have good nighttime vision, um, and so there there are other distinguishing features between the mega and the micro with their head shape and the tails and and sociality and some other things. Um, so with that, we'll take our just our first our first of two bat zen breaks, um, and we will watch a video. Thank you. 
was uh, if if you go on YouTube and search for um, baby bat burritos, you'll find it. Uh, okay, and then part two here is going to be a little bit just more rapid fire uh, kind of trivia facts. Um, we'll go from that incredibly cute video to kind of the the serious side. Um, so bats are you know they're well known they're well known or at least we think of them as carriers of rabies and it is true uh but the the chance that a given bat has has rabies is very small um less than half of 1% of bat populations carry the disease which i don't know may seem like a lot or a little but other cute animals like skunks and raccoons are much like much more likely uh to be a carrier of rabies than bats so most bats are not carriers only a very tiny percentage are um, but even with this knowledge, uh, I would I would still follow the advice of the sign: don't touch any wild bats or raccoons or skunks. Um, but rabies aside, bats are an enormous reservoir for diseases in general, especially diseases that can be transmitted to humans. Again, we are more closely related to bats, um, so things like Ebola, rabies, obviously the the coronavirus that causes COVID nineteen, um, and one of the reasons that bats are so good at harboring infectious diseases is because they have a lifestyle, you know, similar to us crammed in cities, that they're constantly elbow to elbow, ear to ear, um, and that that makes them a, a prime target for an infectious disease that's looking for for something like this that, that can spread easily. Um, infectious viruses don't do as well in solitary animals, but they can really thrive in an animal um, that gathers in such close quarters. And uh, so really, you know, with humans, it was really when we started gathering in cities in high numbers that infectious diseases really became a problem for us too. Um, but on the flip side, bats just do so much good for us. Um, they're, they're excellent pollinators, uh, particularly the megabats who, so the megabats are primarily plant and nectar eaters and the microbats are primarily insect eaters. And the, the bats will visit a flower just like a bee or a bird to get nectar. And in the process, their, their little face gets stuffed with uh, pollen grains that will hitchhike to, to be deposited on, on another flower that the, the bat visits. So if you like bananas, think of bat. Um, and th this wouldn't be your, I guess I should amend that. This isn't your standard grocery store dole bananas. Uh, it's th Those are in a system that's not really natural. But uh, but any wild bananas. So if you go to um, you know a, an ethnic grocery store and you see the different kinds of little bananas or colorful bananas, the the wild wild varieties of bananas are are still um, pollinated by bats. Uh, but bats will disperse bat seeds or banana seeds. Are banana seeds too? Um, and and they will disperse fig wasps or figs figs. Well, excuse me, figs are pollinated by wasps but dispersed uh, by bats. So bananas, figs, mangoes. If you like mangoes, you can think of bat. Um, if you like cashews, think of bat. If you like tequila, think of bat because the agave cactus is pollinated by bats. And maybe the most important PSA today isn't what's written here, um, but it's that many of the larger tequila companies are starting to shift to, because the popularity of tequila the, the bigger companies are shifting to clone tequilas, which introduces a whole lot of problems, or they're starting to harvest the agave in an unsustainable way. So they're kind of, it's, it's a scorched earth way of making a profit, which is very familiar. Bad for the cactus is bad for the bats. And so if you are a tequila enjoyer, um, you might want to do a little research. And, you know, if you, if you find a tequila producer that that uh, works in a bat friendly way, you thank them, support them. And, and if, if, if a company doesn't uh, tell them why you're not supporting them. So, okay. Uh, we already mentioned flight a little bit and, and it's always fun to, to try and figure out through the fossil record, how certain animals evolve flight. Flights evolved several times. It's a very complex activity, um, but it's happened several times. And so the likely scenario with bats is you had this early tree dwelling small mammal, uh, probably the small mammal that gave rise to both bats and humans. And one lineage starts to become really good at jumping. So jumping between branches in a tree, jumping between trees, 
uh, eventually they started to be able to jump farther and farther. And that jumping, you know, is important. It gives you a quick escape from a predator um, or allows you to move through the trees more quickly. It allows you to access parts of a tree uh, that you couldn't otherwise. And then eventually with all this jumping, uh, one, one lineage develops this petygium, which uh, that's so that's that again, that skin, and that probably allows it to glide first. And then, and then because with the bats, the gliding apparatus is mostly on the hands, it's not then that far of a jump to go from gliding to flapping those hands for true flight. And, you know, it, it's a likely scenario when you look at other animals. So the develop of the development of a petygium has happened a lot, uh, not just for, for flying animals, but for swimming animals. Um, so, you know, squirrels and reptiles uh, have have their own swimming petygium um, and, and whales. And then there are other groups that maybe are on the cusp of flying evolutionarily. So uh, fish might be the, the, the closest, but um, if you look at some of these other animals, you have a, a frog that uses the, the web swimming feet to, to take to the air and glide. Squirrels, reptiles, um, uh, you have jumping and a gliding snake, a gliding squid that was new to me. So again, there's several groups that probably could be flying, but I, I think fish are probably the closest because not only do they have these wing-like fins and that can glide, they actually flap them. Um, and, and I've been confused uh, by flapping fish that I thought was a bird, it was actually a flapping fish. And it was actually, you know, for the moment in a headwind flying above the water. So uh, I can't wait for the fish to actually become true flyers. Uh, Cause then as we all know, that will lead to our, our weekly fish watching programs uh, by the Urban Ecology Center. But maybe the coolest other potential future flyer um, might be a lemur. So this is a primate. This is the, the photo I showed, showed earlier. Uh, it's it's a gliding mammal. It's a gliding primate, uh, uh, and it's called the colugo. Look it up. Um, and it's kind of it really demonstrates that that evolutionary step between being a great jumper to an actual flyer. Um, but they're way more closely related to humans than bats are, and they've also evolved like bats to hang upside down independently. And so you that that leads to pictures like this Kalugo mom hanging onto its peeing baby. Uh, pretty amazing. That one's for you, Tori. Um, if we did have a flying lemur, the biggest problem that lemur would face would be, you know, bats are small and flying and they have that hyper increased metabolism. Uh, it's, it's, it's why they're those little bodybuilders. It takes a lot of work and energy. And so one of the ways that bats kind of counteract that energy production into flying is they they dabble in endothermy for a bit. So at night they're active. They're very much warm-blooded super animals protecting the earth from mosquitoes. It's very energetically costly. And then to save energy so that they can do it again tomorrow, um, they sleep during the day. But they don't just sleep. They go into what's called a torpor. And in a torpor, their body temperature will actually lower to the ambient temperature. So if you're in a tropical area you don't have to lower your body temperature too much. And then you're not spending any energy to keep your metabolism going. Um, and so it's, it's like a mini hibernation every night. They just turn off the furnace and deal with whatever, um, whatever happens during the night. Uh, so bats are warm blooded, but they really only act warm blooded when they're out and about when they're asleep, they essentially become cold blooded to save energy. Of course, this only works if the surrounding area isn't too cold. Um, which would become a problem in, in colder areas or in areas like Wisconsin in the winter. It'd be nuts for a Wisconsin bat to keep this pattern up in the winter, A, because the food's gone, but B, because every night they'd have to lower their body temperature to really cold or freezing and then fire it up every, every, you know, every morning they would have to do that. Every night they'd have to fire it up. So our bats either migrate south for the winter or they go into a true hibernation in a cave where they pretty much all but shut down um, their metabolism to make it through the winter. And this is why white nose is so incredibly problematic because the fungus causes a hibernating bat to wake up early and then restarting their engines 
they weren't planning on doing, and then they they essentially run out of gas and and die. So awful disease. And again, because the the hibernating bats are so packed together, like sardines, uh, the white nose fungus can can cause close to 100% mortality in a single cave, which could mean hundreds of thousands of deaths. Okay, guano, bat poop. Uh, it's an amazing fertilizer for plants. It's rich in nitrogen. It has been used for centuries uh, for fertilizer, still is used today, um, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's been so important that both bird and bat fertilizers have caused countries to go to war over access to it. Um, it's not only a fertilizer though, and it's, uh, if you kind of look at the dark side of bat poop, it, you can also extract saltpeter from it and saltpeter is used to make gunpowder. So uh, there's strong evidence that the US Civil War was extended because both sides had access to, uh, to guano. And then they were used that to, to create gunpowder and, and you know in a case where they might've run out. Okay, reproduction. One of the reasons that bats are often threatened or endangered in, in addition to, to their their susceptibility to diseases is they're very slow reproducers. Usually they only have one baby per female per year. So if you have a bat population crash, it can't rebound quickly like, like a mouse population can. It's a very long, slow process. Uh, but most importantly, we need to give props to bat moms, um, not only because they raise their young on their own, bat dads don't help at all, but a bat baby is born at 25% of its mom's weight. 25% and she has to fly around with it right away. And, and the baby, this baby is actually nursing while she's flying. Um, and, and flight is again, extremely taxing energetically already. And now mom has to fly around with a baby attached to her. So that's like a human parent carrying around a 40 pound baby all the time. And that's, that's hard to imagine even if we don't fly, uh, which we don't. So um, that's pretty, pretty amazing. During the nursing season, bat moms do form these maternity colonies and they do help each other out. In fact, bats are one of the animals that show what, what, what could be called altruism. If To the point where if, if one mom is sick and she can't hunt, other moms will hunt and bring her food uh, and to, to kind of help her nurse her back to health, even if they're not related, uh, which kind of flies in the face of, of this Darwinian natural selection a bit. Um, we can save that for another episode. Uh, after white nose syndrome, probably the biggest thing that bats have to worry about is humans. Um, you know, it, unfortunately they creep people out and they're blamed for a lot. You know, they'll, they'll fly in your hair. They'll sneak up to you and bite you at night and give you rabies, suck your blood. Um, you know, none of that's true, but people still seem to hate bats, uh, which leads to super irrational responses. I, I remember seeing a specialist doctor who knew I studied wildlife and he seemed to be so proud to tell me how he found bats in his attic and he went and attacked and killed them with his tennis racket. Um, you know, the, you have the small in incidents like that that build up, but then communities will rally these, these mo you know, the mob mentality. And, and there, there are cases when a community, communities have uh, uh, bombed caves where bats were known uh, to roost because a, a couple of cases of rabies showed up in their village or their city. Um, and this has happened more than once, you know, several times they're, they'll just go in and, and kill, you know, hundreds of thousands of bats at a time. Uh, the fact that they're in these roosting colonies make them easy to destroy. And that sucks on multiple levels, not only because it just sucks, but, you know, it's not gonna do anything to help with the rabies, first of all. Um, you know, it's, it's not likely the bats that are bringing rabies to the village. It's probably some other wild or domestic animal. Um, and then what they're doing is killing like, you know, 99,800 healthy bats to kill the, the 200 bats that are potentially rabid that probably aren't even spreading to humans. And they're probably destroying the wrong kind of bats. They're probably destroying the bats that are pollinators that, that you know, have no way of giving you rabies. So a, a huge amount of destruction. Um, and and you're you're destroying these animals that help keep your insect pest population down and, and are pollinating the food at all because of this kind of poor understanding of how the world works uh, and irrational fears, which then leads us to 
the, the final bit of trivia here that also falls into the humans are pretty dumb category. During World War II, there was a project in the military, an actual uh, research project uh, in, in an arm of the military that was studying how bats could be used to deliver bombs, like actual incendiary bombs to the enemy. And the, the, the plan was to release, to develop this program and then release these bats in Japan um, to help on that front. And, and the person who had the idea actually got the ear of Eleanor Roosevelt, um, who helped then get word to the proper military folks, and they started this project. Uh, thankfully, it never saw through to completion, um, mainly because, again, humans are tend to do really dumb things. And, and while the project was in development, they had several accidents, including a, an, an entire airplane hangar that blew up, uh, and and a, 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 also a general's car had blown up um, during this project. And so the army finally said, "Okay, th this might have been a bad idea." Um, which then leads us to our, our our star of the day, the star of Halloween, the vampire bat. There's only three species of them. Uh, Dan does a good job. In, in his episode, there's and there's a lot of great resources about vampire bats. Um, they don't suck blood. They they actually kind of lap it up with their tongue. But that's to to get to the blood in the first place. They have they have a lot of great adaptations. So uh, first, the bat has to sneak up on its food source, and and the food source is almost in this day almost always livestock. It very very rarely humans. Um, you know sometimes birds and other things, but. Uh, so, so to sneak up on that on this pig, it 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 probably is not going to land on the pig. Um, it's it's it usually lands near what it wants near the food source, and then this is a, another thing that kind of creeps people out is that they walk, and and seeing a bat walk and hop it, again is not what our brains are used to, and it, it it tends to creep you out. But they walk from where they land to the cow or the pig or whatever, and then they usually climb up to 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 find a spot. They can find the spot because they have these fantastic heat sensors that allow them to find a place on the cow where the blood is closest to um, to the skin, and you know, oftentimes it's an ear uh, uh, or you know, part of the face. And uh, then it has these razor sharp teeth that make an incision, um, and it's so sharp that there's like minimal trauma, and the bear, you know, the animal barely notices, like like when you have a good medical practitioner that finds your vein and inserts the needle and you don't even realize it. Um, they have an, like mosquitoes, they have an anticoagulant, which keeps the blood flowing and then allows the bat to lap up its meal. It licks it, laps like a dog. It doesn't suck it. Um, it only needs about one to two teaspoons a night, which to a, a pig or a goat or a cow is, is next to nothing. Um, they're going to be usually no worse for the wear. They don't get the free cookies after giving blood. And then the bat walks or hops away uh, and climbs up something so that it can fly away back to its roost. And um, so it is It is possible, though very unlikely, that they will bite a sleeping human. And it is also possible and very unlikely that they could transmit rabies. Um, but both of those events independently are rare and together are extremely rare. Um, certainly not worth all the massive destruction that, that we tend to put on bats. Um, really, bat, vampire bats in particular should be the model of of cooperation and altruism, and they they take that if, if if a colony of bats goes out to hunt, and and usually not everybody is successful, the ones that do come back with the blood meal to the roost uh, will share the blood that they've uh, achieved or or they've been able to gather with the ones that don't. Um, so uh, it's e even the ones even ones are totally not related to. Um, so, you know, vampires, bats definitely get a bad rap, but, but, uh, they're, they're really the models of like true community members. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I think the connection between bats and vampires and, and Halloween seems fairly straightforward. Uh, the, the obvious connection is that, you know, they're, they're objectively creepy in, in people's, eye, in people's minds. Um, if you have a, a spooky holiday like Halloween, the, the best mascots will be the ones that creep around at night, the spiders and bats. Uh, and then there's the connection with bats and vampires, um, not the vampire bat, but the vampire human uh, or the, the vampire undead human. Um, you know, and, and 
it, this one probably also seems obvious when you look at modern day images of Halloween. Uh, you have you have those teeth. You have the the flying fox personifying a vampire. Um, and you know we, we can't ignore that there's three species of bats that eat blood. So you know what came first? Were the vampires made in the image of bats uh, in our mind, or did the the capes of the counts in Transylvania that became vampires resemble the bats? It's kind of hard to tease that apart. But uh, Jeff Holdeman is a professor at Indiana University. He teaches the course. If anybody's you know interested in going back to school, he teaches a course called "The Vampire in European." and American culture. And he sums it up by saying, in early human history, there's there's many stories of good and evil and the battle between the two. And, and evil isn't just a, a good story. It's often used to explain why bad things happen to people and communities. So uh, the earliest hints of what we might think of a, as a vampire weren't personified. They were a spirit. They didn't suck blood from humans, but they would suck moisture from clouds which caused drought, which led to death and destruction. So this was an explanation for a meteorological event that hurt humans. And that's kind of where the, the vampire starts, it's, it's laying its seed. And then it's not a big leap from an evil force, force sucking moisture from clouds to an evil force that sucks the life out of humans. And this was an explanation for diseases, uh, probably things like multiple sclerosis or, or tuberculosis. Why would a healthy human start to deteriorate? And, you know, again, this is before we understood diseases in epidemiology. So it must be an evil thing that is sucking the life force from that healthy person. And then that's what you try to explain. Uh, and, and, you know, then there's not a big leaf from, you know, sucking the life force from people to sucking the blood from people. Uh, and then, you know, the, the earliest cultures are kind of laying the foundation for what would eventually become this evil person, this undead person. And then the association between vampires and bats really gets cemented permanently when, when Bram Stoker uh, writes that the Dracula. And, you know, in, in that story, Dracula is a shapeshifter, becomes a bat. And then that relationship between bats and vampires is only strengthened since then. So uh, thanks for going along on this journey with me. I, I do have to end with one final moment of Zen um, and we'll watch that right now. So Mr. Batson and I have just come back from a rescue. We picked up Mr. Forrest here. He's in a filthy mood. So um, he's called in by Colin. Colin found him low in his grevilleas this morning. So I think what's happened is that um, he may have come in to feed on the grevilleas and there just simply wasn't enough room for him to take off. It was quite a small yard. So he may have hit the house. But, um, he, there's no injuries on him. I've see if he'd like another bit of none. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there's always room for banana. <laughs> there's always room for banana. Um, so he'll be in care for a little while. He's got no injuries. There's nothing at all I can find on him. Everything's working well. Um, so you'll have a little holiday in care until um, you're sure that he's not concussed or that there's no issues and you can go home. You can have as much banana as you... Oh, he's cranky. <laughs> cranky boy. Yeah. I don't like you people. So he's a big old boy. He's been around the block a few times. He's very strong as well. Didn't take too kindly to being captured, so we had to really, even though he was low, um, they're an arboreal animal that's very capable in the trees. So, um, got Mr. Batzella, Mr. Batzella to put a net on him. He started to take off up the paling fence. So, fortunately, we got you, didn't we? After a bit of a wrestle on the fence. Then we can get you some juice. Would you like a bit more banana? A little bit more banana? Oh, yes, please. Um. All right, we'll go and put him into some bed rest if he'll stay there. Good boy, Mr. Forrest. So, uh, thank you for joining me today. Yeah.
bats are fantastic. They're abundant. They're super important um, and incredibly cute. So I will stop sharing my screen.